that. All right, so uh, in this last lecture, I'm going to focus on the study of this, uh, uh, this probability measure, the, the skips measure, that's the law of a system of particles with Coulomb or Ries interactions. So uh, let me actually rewrite a little bit my, uh, my um, partition function, I'm gonna call it K and beta, so I don't have to have a prime. Uh, this is a reduced partition function, if you want, which is the, the Z and beta that was here that has been uh, divided by all these constant, or by this constant factor uh, that comes out here. So we're gonna study this. Okay. And you remember that after uh, this uh, splitting, we have uh, sort of re-expressed the system as a system of particles that uh, interact, you know, point charges that interact, but that also are neutralized by this uh, background measure mu theta, which is the, uh, the thermal equilibrium measure. So you see here, I've switched my notation from densities uh, denoted rho to densities denoted mu, but it's the same. You should think of it uh, in the same way. Okay, so let's, uh, Let's start with a few uh, things that you can easily obtain. Uh, well, not completely easily, but based on the things I've discussed uh, last week. So re you remember maybe that uh, we have a lower bound for this modulated energy, right? So Fn is bounded below. More precisely, with this truncation method, uh, we prove that Fn, Xn, rho for any rho is bigger than minus Cn, uh, S over D minus one, which is a small quantity. And so this is for every Xn, every rho, that's a bounded probability density. And so in particular, this if you plug that uh, into the, um, the Gibbs measure. So what I want to do is I, I want to rewrite maybe the, the partition function. So the partition function by definition is the normalization uh, that makes this thing a probability. Okay, so it's the integral of this. And if you control the partition function well, then you control your system well in, in a way that uh, I'm going to show. So the first thing to do is to plug in this uh, lower bound. Of course, it's going to give you an upper bound for the partition function. So a trivial upper bound. Uh, which is uh, e to the minus beta over two. So you see there is a cancellation with the s over d's, which is a uh, part of the reason why this factor was chosen to sit here. Uh, and the n two minus s over d plus s over d minus one is going to give you an n. So there is just a c uh, plus c beta n. Yeah. And of course the d mu theta, d mu theta, that just integrates to one. So now we get exactly exponential c beta over two n. Okay, so in particular, this gives an upper bound for the free energy, what's called the free energy here. By definition, this is minus log k or z divided by beta. Uh, and so here it gives you a lower bound for the free energy. Or let's just write a bound for log like, k. Uh, so log k and beta over beta is obviously less than c n. Okay. So that's already an interesting uh, piece of information. What you would like to have is the opposite uh, inequality as well to complement. Uh, and that can also be done, but 
it's a bit more work. And I will say roughly, uh, it's not in all cases. Of course, with the possibly different constants, you will get a uh, minus Cn. So in order to prove uh, the opposite bound, it's a, it's a different game. So first, what we did here was to bound generically, you know, without making any assumption on the configuration, we had, we had a lower bound for the energy. Now we want upper bounds for the energy because we want the inequality in the opposite direction. And you cannot expect that all configurations have a good upper bound. In fact, it's very easy to build configurations that have arbitrarily large uh, energy. Take a configuration, bring two points very close together, just two points, it will uh, make the energy go to plus infinity, just due to the repulsion between the two points. So the energy is not bounded above. But what matters is that sort of on average, it's well bounded. So when you, when you sample the points, with this regular measure mu theta, the configurations with very high energy are not too numerous. They don't contribute too much to the integral. And in fact, here you have an exponential of the integral. So you have to pay a little bit uh, of attention. You have to have this in a strong sense. But there's various, uh, there's various um, uh, ways of obtaining this. One is also based on Jensen. Uh, so ideas or either use Jensen. Jensen's inequality or construct a large enough volume, I would say, of configurations with energy not too large. So what I mean by not too large is uh, bounded by the same order C, let's say Cn S over G minus one, but with a plus this time. The way with Jensen is, is actually much easier, but okay. So with all these things, put them together, uh, we then deduce a bound. for the free energy, uh, a two-sided bound. And of course, if you remember how K and beta was defined uh, as the original Z and beta divided by this thing, this is actually giving you a next order uh, estimate for Z and beta. Uh, so it follows that log Z and beta, that was going to be equal to the leaving order term is given by this uh, factor that has been divided. So if you take the log, you get a minus beta n two minus s over d minus beta n two minus s over d e theta of mu theta. That's the leading order part, and plus o of n. And this is what we have uh, obtained. Mm -hmm. And you can check that uh, when S is a uh, bigger, sorry, strictly less than D, this is always bigger than one. And S is bigger than D minus two. Sorry, so for S between D minus two and D, uh, this is really a, oh, then it's next order if you want. And this thing is leading order. Since we're only discussing um, this, re this regime in, uh, in this lecture. Okay, so this is a first, uh, a first crude bound, I would say, that you can obtain, but even that crude bound was not known for, not proven for a long time. And let me show you how with that, you can already get concentration estimates. So 
uh, what is it about? Well, let's find uh, a bound for what's called the exponential moments uh, of the of the modulated energy, right? So let's try to bound, let's say, exponential beta over two times the energy, the modulated energy. So of course, it's the expectation under P and beta. Okay, so now I, I write down why did I pick this quantity you're going to see right away because, okay, so it's the log of, uh, so in order to compute an expectation, I divide by uh, K and beta. So it's one over K and beta. And what do I have in the, in my integral where I integrate exponential minus beta? Okay, so here I forgot my factor, excuse me. So the same factor n to the, that I never quite remember, two minus s over d. Two minus s over d. Okay, so what I should do is I should write exponentials in a lower case. This will be clearer. Okay, so two minus s over d. And now I'm exponentiating. So this quantity, two minus s over d, f, x, n, mu theta, minus beta times the same quantity. So the, that's the reason I picked this. This is just minus. Yes. Okay, so. Okay, so imagine what you're doing, you're doing the exponential minus beta times the energy with this factor and then plus beta over two. So minus beta plus beta over two, that's minus beta over two. And then the same stuff is, um, is showing up. And then there is of course the d mu theta, d mu theta integral. Okay. So now what's in the log? You can rewrite this as, so in the denominator k and beta, and in the numerator, it's exactly the same type of uh, partition function, except beta has been replaced by beta over two. Okay, so it's k and beta over two. And so now I'm looking at the ratio of partition functions at two different temperatures, beta and beta over two, or two different inverse temperatures. So yeah, now you see why it's useful to understand the partition functions, for instance, with this. And now if we plug in the crude estimate, log k and beta uh, over beta equals O of n, you can plug it once for beta and once for beta over two. In both cases, you find uh, you find that this is uh, this is O of n. Okay, so we get the, the thing we were trying to compute: the log of the expectation of exponential beta over two n two minus s over d. So if you want the uh, exponential moments of the, of the modulated energy, this is O of n. Uh, and now with very simple uh, probability inequalities, you deduce information about the typical configurations. So you have Chebyshev or Markov. So I'm, I'm gonna write this. So this I claim is a concentration inequality uh, because you can uh, write uh, downgraded versions of this. So with Markov's inequality or Chebyshev or whatever you want to call it. Uh, downgraded versions tell you the probability, for instance, that uh, 
f of x n mu theta is bigger than m. Um, so I should have a beta n here. m beta n s over d minus one. That probability is going to be very small if m is uh, large enough. So it's exponential minus c n if m is large enough, right? Because if f was bigger than this, you plug that into into this uh, exponent, exponent, you, sorry, there's no beta. Here probably there's a beta. Okay, so if you plug that in there, you get log exponential, log expectation exponential of a constant times beta times n multiplied by the probability of this event is less than O of beta n. So a constant times beta n times the probability of the event, uh, as soon as the constant can, is made large enough, uh, you can beat. So compared to this O here, you can beat it and you get exponentially small of probability. Okay, so it tells you so the box inequality says that typically, for typical configurations, uh, f of x n u theta is of order by the way, there is an n in all my f script is of order n s over d minus one. That's the right order. And how how so? Well, in exponential moment. Okay, so except with very small probability, which you can quantify if you want. Like okay, so what does it say that f is of order n s over d minus one? Well, that's already a little over one, if you remember, because s is strictly less than d. Um, so this is little over of one and Remember, F metrizes weak convergence. So we also remember that if you take a test function, if you, if you want to compare the empirical measure to mu theta, that thing is going to be less than a constant depending on the norm of phi. Uh, so actually the Lipschitz norm of phi is sufficient times square root of this modulated energy for this electric energy. Okay, so uh, in fact, there is a norm. I told you there is a norm that uh, of of uh, of this measure that can be controlled by square root of f n. So now here we get immediately less than some constants depending on phi times n s over 2d with quantitative of course it tends to zero s over 2d minus one half which is a little over one okay so that means again that typically the distance between the empirical measure and u theta is small and that's the concentration result in the language of probability the, pro the Gibbs measure concentrates near uh, near mu theta. Okay, so um, concentration of the Gibbs measure near mu theta, um, and now you can ask, um, you know, originally what people were asking was rather, do you have concentration near the usual equilibrium measure? 
so also near the usual equilibrium measure, which is somehow, so you know what I denoted mu v, the same as taking mu infinity in mu theta. And so when you when you define mu theta, you're minimizing uh, integral of g d mu d mu plus v d mu plus one over theta integral of mu log mu. So of course, when theta goes to infinity, this term sort of disappears, and then you converge to mu v or mu, that's mu infinity. But in fact, you can show that uh, there is a quantitative. Uh, so we can show very quantitative estimates in terms of theta, uh, in terms of uh, you know negative powers of theta as theta goes to infinity. And here you have to measure in different norms, uh, which I don't want to specify here. So this is a work by Armstrong and myself where we do that for the Coulomb case. So with sharp estimates, I would say. And now if you remember that theta was defined as beta equal times n to some, uh, to some very large power, this is going to be quantitative in n. There's beta to the n. Uh, Okay, it's somewhere in my previous pages, what theta was, what the power is, uh, n one minus s over d. Okay, so as n goes to infinity, mu theta is very close to mu v in a quantitative way. And so if you have a closeness to mu theta, you deduce closeness to mu v. You deduce closeness to mu v. And in fact, mu theta is a better approximation than mu v. So don't, uh, don't think it's a weakness, it's actually a strength to estimate distance to mu theta. Uh, it's, uh, it's better to get uh, to get closeness to mu theta than to mu v, and you can deduce the closeness to mu v. Okay, so now we deduce with that the concentration near the equilibrium measure. So I think that's, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say for now on the concentration. Now I want to mention another thing, which is going to be useful later, is that we can in fact, expand uh, log k to a higher precision. Okay, so higher precision, what do I mean? I mean that you can get a constant that's in this order n here. Uh, so let me show you. Um, so you see this formula that's here? Uh, so this this formula we're going to improve. Okay. And now instead of O of n, there's going to be an exact constant. And we can even get a remind uh, a remainder term. That's precise. So this was done uh, in papers uh, of Loblay and myself. 
uh, in the risk case, I would say, with a remainder that's just little o of n. Uh, and in work with uh, Scott Armstrong, we have uh, improvements for the Coulomb case. So we have a, an explicit remainder in a power remainder n to the minus alpha for some explicit power alpha, depending on dimension. There is also some work of power of Schmidt, uh, Bourgard, Nicola, and Yao in 2D. Uh, and what I want to emphasize, maybe what's interesting is that in 2D, so in the 2D, So this constant here, we have some sort of variational interpretation. Um, and maybe uh, I would say here, so there is variational interpretation for, for C beta that was done uh, in this work with, uh, with Leblay. And in the work with Scott Armstrong, we have this uh, more precise estimate by developing a sub super additivity approach. Following um, ideas of Armstrong's map. Okay, and I want to give you the formula for 2D. So for 2D, 2D log case, it also would work for the 1D log case, but there is a particular thing that's happening is that C beta, uh, you can express it explicitly. So it depends on beta, of course I write it C beta, but it depends also on V. It depends on the whole uh, equilibrium measure or thermal equilibrium measure. You can express it in uh, this 2D log gas as a, okay. as minus beta over four uh, integral of mu theta log mu theta plus some function of beta, which this time is completely independent on V. So this one is independent of V. And I've cheated a little bit. Uh, I should have said this, but uh, I've been sort of avoiding this uh, point uh, for simplicity, but when you're in the log case in 1D and 2D, there's an extra logarithmic factor here. So there's a sort of plus beta over four n mod n when you're in the log case. Uh, that's just additive. So it's, it's really not creating any problem because this term is explicit and uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you see, it's, it's in between this term that would be in n squared and this term that would be in n, there would be an n log n term. It's completely explicit, so not really a problem. Okay, so we have in the 2D log case, we have an exact uh, description or splitting, if you want, of this, uh, the constant that's in front of the order n term. So there is this dependence in the equilibrium measure or thermal equilibrium measure that's explicit. And there is the, part that's completely independent of uh, V. So now this is going to be used in order to uh, obtain a description of the fluctuations. And so now I'm gonna talk about a CLT for fluctuations in the 2D log case. So a lot of these things, first I should say, a lot of these things have been done previously in the 1D log case. So 1D log, uh, very studied due to its connection to random matrix theory. So in the random matrix theory literature, there's a lot of results in the 1D log case. So there's results of uh, Johansson, uh, Borg, Villone, uh, Borgad, Erdoshiao, there's many results. I, I wouldn't have uh, maybe time to put them all here. 
but they exploit very much the fact that it's 1D. And in 1D, there's a lot of things that are nicer, in particular, you can order the particles, you know? And so, because they repel each other, they can never completely run into each other. They stay in their lane somehow, they remain ordered. And in 2D or higher, you don't have that anymore. So a lot of things also disappear. Not only you have order, but you also have this convexity of the interaction, etc. Okay, so now I want to discuss this 2D log case, which is uh, more delicate and for which there's been a progress uh, recently. Uh, and the theorem that, that we have with, uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's with Thomas Leblay and then there's some sort of improvements uh, by myself. And there was also a version by Bauer Schmidt, Bourgat, Nicola Agnao. Okay, is that um, if you take C to be a test function, so how regular do you need C to be? Um, doesn't matter very much, but let's say a C4 test function. Uh, then if you test this difference, sum of Dirac minus the equilibrium measure with C, and you multiply by N actually. So it's very large rescaling. This thing converges in law to a Gaussian. Uh, of mean some a certain quantity that I don't want to describe and variance equals to uh, one over two pi beta integral what c square. Okay, roughly. Huh? I'm not. Uh, giving a completely exact statement, but this is it. Okay, so this is a, it's actually a quite a maybe surprising statement because you see here the normalization is not at all the one for the standard CLT. You have a sum of variables, right? The sum of C of XI, yeah? You have N variables. And you're not really normalizing them at all because you have an n times one over n. So you're not normalizing by one over root n, uh, like in the standard CLT. So here, beta is fixed. Right? Beta fixed. And this is as n goes to infinity. Uh, so the fact that you don't need to normalize means that it's much more rigid somehow than a standard central limit theorem. And you see it says that these uh, fluctuations are very small because if you multiply them by n, you have a limit. So they're of size one over, one over n in some sense. And this can be re-expressed in terms of uh, uh, rephrasing the object which is inverse Laplacian of that, which is my, my H's from before. So let's say uh, this, right? Which is G controlled with sum of the minus N mu theta or N times H N converges to what's called the Gaussian filter. And this is something that you see from the definition of the Gaussian free field and from the expression of the variance. So the, the covariance structure that you see here is the one that lets you identify uh, the Gaussian free field. Okay, so now I want to say a word about uh, our method of proof because it uses the ingredients that we've seen before. So the starting point of the proof is uh, due to, uh, uh, it's a fairly classical uh, idea, but in this context, 
It appears first in this paper of Johansson that's well, uh, well known on the 1G uh, log gas case, is to compute the Laplace transform of the fluctuations. Okay, so you want to understand uh, the sum of xi of xi, right? So somehow what, you, what you're really trying to understand is sum of xi of xi. Right? Okay, so you want to compute, let's say the log Laplace transform, so log of expectation, P and beta, exponential T sum of xi of xi, right? Now, without loss of generality, so uh, uh, by the way, so how do you, do you think? Well, you think, okay, if I want to show something converges to a Gaussian, it suffices to show that the Laplace transform converges to the Laplace transform of a Gaussian. The Laplace transform of a Gaussian is a, is a Gaussian. <laughs> so it suffices to show that the log Laplace transform converges to a quadratic function in T. Right? So what you want to show is that this converges to some thing of this form, uh, sigma t squared, there's maybe a one half somewhere. So something like that. Okay, so now without loss of generality, uh, you will agree probably that I can change this into looking at nt sum of c of xi and take later some tau equals to nt uh, and then look at tau as my variable for the Laplace transform. Okay, so that means I wanna look at t equals tau over n where tau is gonna be fixed of order one. And so t is very small. Uh, and I want to compute now with this. So why did I put n in the in the mix? Because now if I re-express this log of the expectation, it's a bit like what we did before. Uh, it's the same as computing the log of one of k on beta. And what do we have in our expectation? Well, we have exponential minus uh, Beta. So I'm going to write it in terms of z. If you want me. I'm going to go back to the original uh, formulation, one over z and beta. And here, what did we have? We had the minus beta. So there is n to the s over d minus one, but in uh, dimension two log, this is what I'm looking at now, s is zero. So I don't have to worry about this factor. Uh, so I just have to put hn. I'm just I'm going back to the original energy. So minus beta hn plus uh, nt. Let's move this a little bit. Okay, plus nt sum of c of x. Okay, dx1, dxn. Nice. So now what? Does this correspond to well? Here you're computing the partition function of uh, the same log gas, except you've added some sort of force, some outside potential, which is C of xi, right? Because if you remember, Hn is the sum of G xi minus xj, so there's a one half here, plus n sum of Z of xi. And so here, it's the same as looking at H and T, the same, but I have a VT with VT equals to the same V I had before, but I add to it minus T over beta C. Right, so if I take V and I add minus T over beta, See, I refine exactly the same, uh, the same type of uh, formula. So in other words, I can define Z and T to be 
Zn associated with potential Vt. Of course, V0 is my same V as before in Vt, is a perturbed uh, external potential. Okay, so now what we're looking to compute is the log of the uh, Laplace transform e to the nt sum of c over psi is simply the log of the ratio ZNT divided by ZN zero. So again, we come back to a question of computing ratios of partition functions. And what, are, what is happening here? We're doing a small perturbation of the potential V by changing it into Vt, which is V plus minus this. It's a small perturbation because I said later I'm going to take T to be of order one over n. So as n goes to infinity, it's a small perturbation. Okay, so now what do we want to understand? We want to understand this Znt divided by uh, Zn zero. But now what do we do? We remember that Zn, we have some expansion of it, uh, log Znt. Uh, in the end, it's log of something very explicit, which involves this e theta of mu theta, plus log of this Kn, my reduced, uh, yeah, we'll call it Knt. Okay, so up to uh, an explicit factor, So this explicit things, you know, involves theta, theta. So that I can compute and I can take out of the, of the computation. So up to an explicit factor, we have to compute log of Knt divided by Kn zero. Okay, so what is now Knt? So it's the expectation of e to the minus beta. Uh, so I have an n squared. Yeah, I want to rewrite uh, the expression in terms of f now. So n squared f. f of xn mu theta T, right? T mu theta T, T mu theta T divided by the same with no T. Okay, so mu theta is the term or equilibrium measure for T equals zero. And mu theta t is the thermal equilibrium measure for t. And the idea is that, well, this one's going to be a small perturbation of that one. And we can try to linearize. So we can try to linearize in t. OK, so. Um, the idea is that we're going to do a transport, a change of variables. That's the method it's based on that. We have two probability densities, right? Mu theta and mu theta t. So we want to find a transport map which is close to identity. It's going to be identity plus something small. So let's say identity plus t times psi, which uh, at leading order, t, transports mu theta to mu theta t. The idea is that if you can describe mu theta well, if you if you know quite well how mu theta depends on on t, well then you can know what kind of c you need to take. 
So I don't want to get too much into detail, but you can compute. Uh, so the right C is computable in, in this case. And you can even find it's not so difficult that it's uh, that it's minus grad C divided by mu theta. It's the right uh, it's the right map. Okay, so mu theta t is going to be approximately, and this is not an e equality, but identity plus t psi push forward mu theta plus if you want little o of t. So there's some errors, but they are small uh, uh, at leading order at order one t. So there are little o of t. Okay, so now we look at this uh, ratio of integrals, which are partition functions. And we're gonna write the first integral, the, the, the numerator. We're gonna make this change of variables. Mu theta is identity plus t psi push forward of mu. So mu theta t is the push forward of mu theta. Okay, so with this, and let me, uh, for the sake of presentation, let me assume that I have an equality here. Right? Let's not worry about the errors. So then the, the integral that I'm trying to compute e to the minus beta n squared f xn mu theta t t mu theta t t mu theta t. I can write this as e to the minus beta n squared f of, well, instead of having x1 xn, I'm gonna have identity plus, so I'm gonna have x1 plus t psi of x1, x2 plus t psi of x2. This is the definition of the proof forward. So that's my configuration. And this is mu theta t. D mu theta, d mu theta. So that's definition of push forward. And now, uh, the way I rewrite this, if you allow me, is integral e to the minus beta n squared f of phi t of xn. Phi t push forward mu theta zero. D mu theta, D mu theta, and where I have defined phi t to be this uh, identity plus t psi, right? The small perturbation of identity. So of course, what I mean is I do it also on the level of the whole configuration. I push each point by identity plus t psi. Uh, and so now what we are having to compute is the log of the integral of e minus beta n squared f, blah, blah. Of this n times. And I have this at t equals zero. So you can linearize. All right, so you can write that the, the thing that's in the numerator, it's e to the minus beta n squared f x n mu theta plus or minus beta n squared d d t. So I have a t, d d t at t equals zero of f by t. Okay, and then there is a new data to the n plus divided by the same two. Okay, so this is the log of the integral by the log of the what I can write now is I can write this as the log of an expectation because I have my partition function in the denominator. I have my uh, energy here in the exponent. So I have the log of the expectation of exponential minus beta n squared t. And here I have this quantity, which is the time derivative 
Of course, I've neglected next order terms. Right? Everything that's of order t squared, I just throw out for, for now. Okay, so that's what we're computing when we're linearizing. And so now we have to look at the variation of the modulated energy when we have these points that are all moved according to this uh, vector field psi, so identity plus t psi. And this density mu theta that's also moved according to the same, uh, uh, the same uh, transport psi. And what you can compute, and it's, it's a direct computation from the definition of Fn, is that when you make this type of transport or displacement, you get the same type of terms we were, we were seeing before, which is grad g x minus y dotted c of x minus c of y. Right, so do the computation. It's a, it's really a pointwise thing. There is no, um, it's, it's a sophisticated calculus uh, exercise, but you find exactly this. So you find exactly the terms that were appearing in the commutator estimate or in the functional inequality, where now the velocity field is this transport map psi that I've defined and that I've chosen to be a good transport map to transport the equilibrium measure. Okay, so now what's good with this is we have some estimates. So equals commutator estimate or functional inequality term. And in particular, we know that it's of same order as the energy itself. Fn. Uh, mu theta, and that thing is of order n, you know, up to small probability events. So in exponential moments, it's, it's of order n. So we have an idea of the size of this first derivative, and we can control the size of the second derivatives. So what we're going to do now is, uh, so let me call this A. So call, we call this A like uh, anisotropy in 2D. But... A of Xn and Psi. So what we, what we obtained with this uh, procedure is we have two ways of computing the ratio of partition functions. So we have community divided by Kn is log of expectation of essentially uh, e to the minus beta n squared t a. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, so this is one way. And on the other hand, we have the second way which is by uh, using these expansions to next order that I've written for you before. I told you this would be useful later, and it is here. You see, we had some expansion, and that was telling us that the log k term, this is actually this part, is of this form. Okay, so now if you look at the ratio of uh, partition functions or the difference of log k's that corresponds to two different v's. Because this term here is independent of v, when I make the difference, uh, this term is going to disappear in the difference. Okay, so when I go back to here, the second way, because I have this ratio, which makes a difference of log of partition functions, I'm going to have a log of well, actually, I'm going to have uh, some something of the form minus beta 
over two integral of mu to the t log mu to the t minus mu to the log mu to the oh, there's an n minus n to the over two this is the second way and this is with cancellation of the f of beta term, which is lucky because in fact, we don't know how to compute this f of beta. So if it wasn't canceling, uh, uh, we wouldn't really be able to completely proceed like this. So if I'm not mistaken in my constant, this is what I have. So minus n beta over two, let's go back, beta over four, I think. Beta over four. Okay, so we're almost done with explaining the idea now because you see I have two different ways of expanding this ratio of partition function. One that uses uh, the time derivative of f along the transport, so my term a, and one that uses the uh, next order expansion that we've developed with uh, Leble and with Armstrong. And then we can you can start playing with both, with the two because this can be estimated. So this uh, this thing can be also linearized in t. So it's equal to you know t times uh, something. Let's call it b b one plus o of t squared. And so by uh, by comparing the two and playing with different values of t. So because this is true, as long as t equals little o of one, we can identify the exponential moments of a. in terms of B1. And B1, this B1 is computable, you know, like you know, you know these equilibrium measures well enough that you can compute this thing. So now we can identify the exponential moments of A and then we can plug that back in and plug them back in. But uh, of course we're gonna make an error, uh, with, with some error. Uh, little o of n, and we can plug back in the first way with now t taken to be much smaller and obtain log kn tau over n divided by kn up to error little o of one. So what's the magic of it is that you reduce your error from little o of n to a little o of one because now you apply it to t, which is of order tau over n. And so that actually allows you to prove what you want. When you put all the ingredients together, you show that zn tau over n divided by zn, that's equal to something which is linear in t which comes out of all these computations, the variance that I was talking about, that also comes out of all these computations, plus, so that should be a tau, right? plus something which is little of one, as n goes to infinity, and this is for fixed tau. Right? right, and so this, this is the, Roughly the proof of the central limit theorem. And this finishes just in time. I want to mention maybe in one minute that uh, we have localized versions of all this. So we have localized versions of this result. That come by using also local laws so it's, uh, you know, again, the same uh, and local laws, same set of authors. Local 
walls. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, uh, you know, if you have your equilibrium measure and you have your points, uh, so far we've taken test functions C that were fixed. I've discussed the case where, you know, you take a test function and you, and you compute sum of C of Xi minus integral of C D mu. Okay. But now what you can do is you can take C that actually lives in a very small set. So you could have the support of C depend on N. And so you could take, for example, now C equals C naught of X over some power of N. Uh, so a function that's supported at a much smaller scale than the micro scale. And this is okay down to micro scale. So, okay, as long as, so I'm gonna write here some land scale L. And see this time this C naught is fixed, but this one lives at a smaller and smaller scale. As long as L is much bigger than the micro scale, which is n to the minus one over dimension. So such things are also available. Okay, so if you have any questions, otherwise I thank you for your attention.